great. The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to First Presbyterian Church on this gorgeous Lord's Day. We are delighted that you have chosen to worship the Lord of heaven and earth with us, either here in person or by live stream. A warm welcome to all of you. There are a number of additional opportunities uh, in addition to uh, worship that we offer here at First Press. I invite you to look at the back of your bulletin or uh, near the end of your bulletin to read more about those many opportunities. I am going to highlight just a few of them. Today, right after worship, the youth are going to lunch and uh, for lunch and a conversation uh, with Pastor Margaret, and you may meet in the narthex to do that after worship. Uh, on Wednesday, our Lectio Divina Bible study is beginning a new study. We're starting our study of Philippians, which is one of my favorite books in the Bible, uh, Paul's letter to Christians in first century Philippi. That's a Zoom Lectio uh, Divina Bible study at 9.30 every Wednesday. And this is a good time to jump in and participate as we are starting a, a new book uh, this Wednesday morning, 9.30. Then on Thursday, it is Give More 24, an opportunity for you to give to a wide variety of nonprofits in our community, including Fish, uh, Habitat for Humanity, Friends of the Carpenter, and many more. Uh, do encourage you to check that out and uh, learn how you can give through the Give More 24 effort. Friday, our Theo Cafe small group is also starting a new study. We are reading the book, uh, History of God, or maybe it's The History of God, uh, one or the other. And it's written by Karen Armstrong. We're starting that book uh, this Friday at 11. We meet up the street at Latte Dot on 39th Street. And we meet for about an hour, drink coffee together. They also have food at Latte Da, and we uh, discuss this theology book. Uh, it's, again, it's uh, The History of God by Karen Armstrong. We're reading the first two chapters for this Friday morning. And finally, next Sunday after worship is our next new member class. If you've been uh, worshiping with us for uh, a while and have uh, questions about how you might join our church, or even if you're not interested in joining but would just like to learn more about the Christian faith, uh, the Reformed Presbyterian tradition, and our local congregation and our various mission efforts, I encourage you to attend. We'll start shortly after worship in the fireside room. We will have lunch. Uh, so if you can give Pastor Margaret or me a heads up that you're planning to attend, that will help us make sure we have enough food. We'd love to see you there, and it's a, it's a free-flowing conversation uh, a great opportunity for you to ask any questions that you might have uh, about the, um, the Christian faith and the Presbyterian tradition. Again, that's next Sunday, right after worship, and we should wrap up by 2.30 in the afternoon. The psalmist sings, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us prepare to worship Almighty God.
Please stand as you are able in body or spirit and join with me in the call to worship. God's constant love reaches to the heavens. God's faithfulness extends to the skies. God's righteousness towers like the mountains. God's justice is deeper than the sea. In the New Testament, we read that baptism signifies being clothed with Christ. Our rags of sin have been covered by Christ's robe of righteousness. Confident that Christ has got us covered, let us confess our sin, first responsibly and then in silence. Let us pray together. Lord, you said, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Lord, you said, you may ask for anything in my name. Lord, you said, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Lord, you said, you must testify, for you have been, for you have been with me. Lord, you said, love each other as I have loved you. And hear now, O Lord, our silent prayers of confession. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen. Hear the good news. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ came to save sinners. Friends in Christ, we are forgiven. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's take a moment to pass the peace of Christ and other greetings to our neighbors. Peace of Christ be with you, choir.
morning, young disciples, and all older disciples, too. It's good to see you. Um, for those of you who are in school, I hope that that is going well for you so far and that the new school year is getting off to a good start. Oh, yes, Robbie. I'm, Michael, I heard. That's right. What? Oh, I'm sorry about that. That is a bummer. I know the Ridgefield schools are on strike right now, so we are definitely keeping them in prayer. What? Ah, okay. Well, here at church, we're doing some new things in this new school year as well. And the first thing is that if you are a young disciple, you're invited to come forward during this time if you'd like. So you can sit up here so we can see each other a little bit better. We're really excited that we can do that again. I don't think we have anybody right here today that would like to come up. But if you would, oh, I see a couple people in the back. If those of you in the back would like to come forward, you can. You don't have to, but if you'd like to, you're welcome. It looks like they're coming. We'll give them a moment to come. They're in the back little room, so they're coming out and around. <laughs> and Robbie's, I mean, Michael is here. Michael's going to help me a little bit today, which is great. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Come on up here. It's good to see you. All right, I'm going to grab this. So you can either sit here in the front pew, or if you'd like, you can sit up here on the steps with me, whatever you like. You want to sit here with me? Okay. Robbie, Michael, would you come over here so you can help me with this? All right, so we're here in worship. And now we spent all this time together in worship, but what is worship really about? So I don't know. What are your thoughts? Do you have thoughts? Okay. No. Okay. Well, worship, we do kind of two things. One thing is that we celebrate God together. So we spend all this time and we celebrate God in a bunch of different ways. And we also learn more about Jesus. And so we do that in a lot of different ways. We've already done a few of them this morning. So the first thing is we love music. We love to sing. We listen to the choir um, sometimes we listen to other instruments too, like the organ, and sometimes Ed even has the accordion, which is neat. And then sometimes over here, um, we have a bell choir, and they have bells, and they ring them with their hands all together. Like, everybody has one note. I think it's, it's really cool. So we celebrate God with music, and so we celebrate God with our voices and with our ears, but sometimes we like to celebrate God, we like to sing um, with our bodies too. And so we have in this little basket here, these little worship baskets, which when you come in at the back, they're on the table. Um, but we have these. They're dancing ribbons. So we can dance with the music too. So would you like that one? All right, and Robbie's got one, and there's more in the back. So that's one way we can, we can dance with God with all of our music. So you can do that in the pews. You can do that in the back room. It's, it's okay to stay in the aisle too, but when you're dancing, just kind of be careful not to, like, run into anybody else. Um, there's going to be two in every basket. So, that's, so you can have one in each hand if you like, or there's one that you can share with somebody else. And so if there's an adult sitting next to you or another kid, you can share one with them, and they'll dance. Then they, then they, need, then they need to dance with you too, okay? There's also some extras in the back in case you have some, an extra person you want to share one with or if any of the adults would like to do that as well. So... We, can, we celebrate God with music. We also celebrate God by telling the truth. And there's both the good things and the not-so-good things. So like we just had in the, in the worship here, we had this time of confession where we tell God about some of the things that didn't go so well in the last week. Um, and we don't have them in our, in our baskets here today, but we are getting whiteboards for them. And so on the whiteboards, you, during that time, you can draw or write something that you're sorry for or you want to be, you would like the next week, you would like to go better next week. And then, just like every day, every Sunday, Pastor Josh or I or one of our other people reminds us that Jesus loves us and forgives us, then when we get to that point, you can, we have an eraser and you can wipe that off of your whiteboard. Remember that Jesus wipes our sins away and gives us a chance to start fresh. So that's, a, so that's telling the truth in our baskets. And we've got some other things in here, too. So we've got these little papers that, and some coloring sheets that are usually about what, 
one of the pastors is talking about today. So help us learn more about Jesus. And we've got some crayons and scissors and glue and some markers and other little crafty things. And then there's usually some little thing like this in there that we can play with and keep our fingers busy. So that's in the worship baskets. Um, and then during the sermon and the prayer time, we also have another th new thing. We can go over, let's go over here together. We have this little area, come on. So we call this area, we're start, we have this little place right over here where you can come during the, the sermon and prayers, and we have activities here. So we have more little papers, and we've got um, crafts and coloring utensils and extra papers, and there's some books and some toys over there. And we call this area the playground. Playground. So it sounds like playground, so it's to help us remind us that it's a place where we can have fun. But we call it the playground instead of, we say pray instead of play to remind us that we're also focusing on Jesus during this time. So, what? I know, it does sound really similar. Sometimes I get it mixed up. My tongue gets all turned around. But it's called, but that's what we're trying to call it, the playground. Yeah. So, um, you, this is a great place that you can come during that time. And it's okay to make a little noise. Um, but we try to stay kind of quiet so that we don't distract too many other people as well, because sometimes the adults get a little bit jealous. So uh, we don't want to make them too jealous. So um, yeah, and then um, if you're feeling not, if you're feeling a little noisier mood for the day, there's the room in the back where you guys were just earlier, so you can go back there too if you'd like, and there's also some toys and activities there, um, but this space is here for you too. Um, and then at the end of, towards the end of the service, we always have an offering. We talk about offering. And most of the time, we think about people giving money during that time. But that's not the only thing that we can give to God in the church. So if you're ever here and you do a drawing or you make a little craft project that you'd like to share with God or in the church, you can always leave that by the offering box in the back, too. Um, or if you have something at home that you'd like to bring, we'd love that as well. Okay, so these are some of the things that we can do during worship together. Um, but yes, since we're in the pray ground, shall we pray? Okay, you can repeat after me. Dear God, dear God, thank you for the opportunity to worship. Yes, help us to celebrate you, to learn more about Jesus, and have fun together as the church. Amen. Amen. Okay, great. And you can stay here if you'd like. All right. Thank you, Pastor Margaret. So the last time I preached was two Sundays ago, and the next day someone threw a concrete block through my office window. So I just want to say, if you don't like my sermon, please just come talk with me about it. No need to throw heavy objects through my office window. As we prepare to hear the good news, let us pray. Breathe on us, breath of God. Fill us with life anew. Amen. When a great crowd gathered and people from town after town came to Jesus, he said in a parable. We find this scene repeated over and over in the Gospels. People come to Jesus hungry for knowledge, hungry for wisdom, hungry for good news. And he responds with parables, little fictions, teaching stories, creative illustrations. Jesus was a teacher, and one of his favorite, favorite methods of teaching was telling stories. Last Sunday, we started a sermon series on the parables of Jesus. Pastor Margaret kicked things off with an excellent sermon on the parable of the sower. Through the third Sunday of November, Christ the King Sunday, and also our Stewardship Sunday this year, we will be pondering several of Jesus's parables. 
Here is the complete list. Today we're looking at the parable of the unforgiving servant in the Gospel of Matthew. And then next week we will jump into the Gospel of Luke, which is where we find the majority of Jesus' parables. Next Sunday we'll hear the parable of the rich fool, sometimes called the parable of the barns. And the right Reverend Russell will be preaching on that parable, also known as Pastor Bill over there. Then on the first Sunday of October, which is World Communion Sunday, I will be preaching on the parable of the barren fig tree. Second Sunday of October, Pastor Margaret is up again. She'll be preaching on two parables, the parable of the mustard seed and of the yeast. And I am wondering if you end up with mustard bread when you preach on those two parables together. We'll find out on the second Sunday of October. Then it's the parable of the feasts. I'll be preaching on uh, two little parables that both have to do with feasts. And then on the parable of the salt. And then on Reformation Sunday, the last Sunday of October, I'll be preaching on the lost sheep and the lost coin. Again, two little parables that have a similar focus. And then the first Sunday of November is All Saints Sunday. It will be a jazz Sunday. We make a big deal on All Saints Day. It's like a second Easter uh, for us, and I will be preaching on the very familiar and much-loved uh, parable of the prodigal son and his brother. I know you're familiar with that parable. I will be uh, looking at it from a different angle this year and talking about what it says uh, to us about stewardship. And then on the second Sunday of November, Pastor Margaret will stick with that stewardship theme. She'll be preaching on the dishonest steward, the parable of the dishonest steward, and then we'll wrap up this sermon series, as well as our stewardship season, with the parable of the rich man and Lazarus on Christ the King Sunday. Stewardship Sunday, the Sunday before Thanksgiving, and the last Sunday of the Christian year before the first Sunday of Advent. And the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is wild. I am looking forward to preaching on that. Our parable to ponder this morning is Matthew 18, 21 through 35, the parable of the unforgiving servant. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to Peter, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children, and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So, my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. 
Matthew 18, 21 through 35, often called the parable of the unforgiving servant. The word parable is a transliteration of a Greek word that means a comparing, a likening. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle the accounts of his slave. A parable is a short story that likens one thing to another thing. God to a forgiving father, for example. Jesus uses parables frequently in the Gospels. Mark 4, 33 reads, With many parables Jesus spoke to them as they were able to hear it. Now Jesus offers a strange explanation for his use of parables. In Luke, he says, To you, his disciples, his followers, it has been given to know the secrets or the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others I speak in parables, so that looking they may not perceive, and listening they may not understand. Whatever else is made of this cryptic statement, it's clear the parables are not easy to wrap our minds around. Like the kingdom, some of them illustrate they are mysterious. Given this mysteriousness, it should not be surprising to learn that biblical scholars and theologians have not always agreed on how best to interpret the parables. And to my mind, this fact is part of what makes a study of them so fascinating. Different interpretive approaches have included looking for a moral generalization, looking for a single theological theme, looking for a variety of theological themes, looking for existential themes, that is, experiences common to human existence, and looking for subversive socio-political teachings. Given this diversity of approaches, epistemic humility is in order, by which I mean this. It's wise for us to hold our interpretations loosely. Their, um, their creativity, the creativity of the parables, invites multiple interpretations. And certainty is overrated anyway. Certainty stifles imagination. The parable of the unforgiving servant offers an opportunity to test drive all of these interpretive approaches. As we ponder this parable's meaning, we might start by seeking to identify a moral generalization. Among other things, Jesus was a teacher of ethics. Think the Sermon on the Mount, which is found earlier in the Gospel of Matthew. It's the largest chunk of Jesus' teaching, and its focus is on establishing kingdom ethics. Does the parable of the unforgiving servant teach a moral generalization, a rule of thumb ethic? I think it does. Quite obviously, it teaches that it is right to forgive. 77 times, says Jesus, which is a creative way of calling people to forgive repeatedly, again and again. But more broadly, Jesus tells this story to illustrate the golden rule, which he has taught earlier in the Sermon on the Mount. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. The servant is forgiven the debt he owes to his master. But he then refuses to forgive a debt owed to him. He does not do as he has had done to him. And his lack of mercy provokes his master's anger. Another approach to this parable is to try to name a single theological theme a main theological emphasis. If I had to identify one theological theme in the parable of the unforgiving servant, it would be grace. 
grace is a theme that threads throughout the scriptures. Augustine defines it as unmerited favor. Earl Palmer explains grace as surprise, gift, joy. It's a surprising gift that brings joy. The servant in this story doesn't deserve to have his debt forgiven. He really does owe it, and it's only out of pity that his master graciously forgives it. It's a gift that no doubt was surprising and that no doubt brought the servant joy. Of course, there are other themes in this parable as well, and we may prefer to reflect on a variety of theological themes as we ponder it. I wonder if the line, grace, mercy, and forgiveness will help a man walk tall, was written after reading this parable. That's a line from the great theologian John Mellencamp. Do you not know who John Mellencamp is? Raise your hand if you know who John Mellencamp is. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Pastor Margaret, did you have your hand up there, John Mellencamp? <sighs> All right. Grace, mercy, and forgiveness will help a man walk tall. Certainly, we find this constellation of theological themes in this parable. Still, the forgiven servant does not walk tall, does he? The forgiven servant becomes an unforgiving servant. And that brings us to another theological theme, one that comes up repeatedly in the Gospels. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a vice that Jesus rails against again and again. And here, he makes a hypocrite the villain of the story. If theological themes don't capture our imagination, we might try considering existential themes. And again, the term existential refers to human existence. Are there themes in this parable that are common to the human experience? Experiences that we all have. What about debt? Have we not all experienced debt? Many of us owe or have owed money. All of us owe God. We owe God our life and our new life. God is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. We are all indebted to God. A final approach to this parable is to glean possible subversive socio-political teachings. Jesus was not a sponsor of the status quo. Sponsoring the status quo doesn't get you killed. This parable makes clear that he's dissatisfied with the gap between the wealthy and the poor. Uh, debt relief is one way of addressing this gap of lessening economic inequality. Here, he's illustrating another part of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And note this consistency. He expects both wealthy masters and poor servants to forgive their debtors. What a rich little story. And we have certainly not mined all of its possible meanings. Is one interpretation better than the others? I would say that depends on you. Which interpretation best helps you to follow Jesus? Which interpretation best helps you to forgive freely. Not seven times, but 77 times. With many parables, Jesus taught them as they were able to hear it. May the Spirit give us ears to hear the wisdom of Jesus this day and in the weeks ahead. Amen.
Please stand as you are able in body or spirit to join in the affirmation of faith, which comes from the Confession of 1967. The reconciling work of Jesus was the supreme crisis in the life of humankind. His cross and resurrection become personal crisis and present hope for women and men when the gospel is proclaimed and believed. In this experience, the Spirit brings God's forgiveness to all, moves people to respond in faith, repentance, and obedience, and initiates the new life in Christ. Now we have a moment for mission, and Larry Grell, representing our mission ministry team, is going to introduce our guests. Larry? Have I got a treat for you this morning. As you can see, Jim and Gene and I are with us, and uh, it's always good to have them here. They are longtime friends of this church, as well as mission partners. I should know the number of years, but it's a lot of years. Uh, today they're going to be giving you a uh, quick update on the Melanesia Boat Project slash Build the Boat Project. We're progressing along in this gigantic project and these two have more energy than any 10 people, so I'm very sure they've got a great update for you. Welcome to First Prez, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here. And uh, our strength comes from the Lord, that's for sure. And uh, we're so blessed to be running this race with perseverance that uh, the Lord has laid out before us. And uh, we are, are very excited and um, energized by the idea of going back and uh, launching this program. It's not about one boat. It's about a number of boats uh, that would serve uh, in the general region of Melanesia. You're gonna watch a video uh, that we have that we put together with a number of the photos came from our personal experience and some video was uh, added in there. Rich Maddock, who is the director of Tyndale Bible Translators, has uh, almost 30 years now in the field and he was with uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators for 25. Uh, and just uh, a handful of years ago, Rich started Tyndale Bible Translators to be able to get into more specific and unusual projects 
to support Bible translation and scripture engagement. And uh, the other person you're gonna see referenced here in this uh, five minute video is Mr. Tom Hamilton. Rich and Tom have been uh, in a relationship since Rich Maddox and his wife Joyce graduated from college. Tom and his wife started supporting them. Tom is an aircraft designer and engineer. And around the year 2000, Tom and Rich got together and talked about the problems associated with aviation and the wide variety of aircraft that were trying to be used and supported and operated. And it was becoming a logistical uh, nightmare to, to manage. And so Tom uh, was put on his heart by the Lord to design a specific aircraft for mission aviation and mission transportation. And so you're gonna watch that video now and then we'll have a few comments afterwards. All right, thank you. I'm Rich Maddox, director of Tyndale Bible Translators. Accessing people to share the gospel and meet physical needs takes roads, boats, or aircraft. God brought a major improvement in missions with the Kodiak. Designed by Christian engineers and missionary pilots, it is purpose-built and rugged enough to reach people groups with no road access. Instead of mission agencies continuing to make do by modifying old airplanes, God blessed this courageous endeavor to build what was needed to get the job done. Today, 35 of these Kodiaks are serving the poor and needy, saving lives physically and spiritually around the world. Notably, because the next generation is eager to serve in the safe and rugged Kodiaks, the one-third drop in young people choosing to serve as missionaries is not happening among those serving as pilots. But who can't be reached by roads, helicopters, and Kodiaks? In the South Pacific, there are 15 nations. In the Solomon Islands, there are 300 inhabited islands, but only 34 airstrips. In the Republic of Fiji, there are 110 inhabited islands and 25 airstrips. There are about 910 total inhabited islands in the Pacific and at least 400 languages needing Bible translation work. Yet, the only available sea transportation is unsafe commercial boats. Tyndale Bible Translators is called to change this. Two of the board members, both missionaries with 57 combined years of experience, looked at the impossibility of the task both knew of the attempts of larger and smaller agencies over the decades to build smaller boats or modify boats and to make do. Some agencies are using helicopters and commercial boats to position their Bible translation and ministry teams into this remote area. They knew of the excellent work of other larger evangelism ships whose ship captains are asking for smaller outreach vessels to serve the outlying islands. Smaller vessels are needed to conduct ministry and medical survey work before their larger ships are committed to an area. Both these Tyndale board members knew James and Gina Nye and the five tenacious years the Nyes had spent in Melanesia serving from their own sailboat, administering missionary maritime programs for other agencies. Because of the Nyes management skills and experience as mariners, they were asked to assess the needs in the South Pacific. They presented their conclusion for purpose-built ships with open ocean capability that can provide safety, stability, and accommodation, including clinic space for dental, medical, and outreach teams, a scripture recording studio and training rooms, along with cargo space for humanitarian aid and other ministry engagement needs. Such vessels would accomplish what the Kodiaks have done for mission aviation to give access to unreachable islands and approach these islands safely over shallow reefs. Here is an example, a craft built for NOAA to study marine biology. The Nye's report and proposal of a 20-meter catamaran platform had been rejected by other mission administrators. Could God use Tyndale Bible Translators to help Christians and other NGOs worldwide meet this God-sized task to design and launch a purpose-built craft to reach and minister to these remote island peoples? 
The Tyndale board is unanimous that God wants us to move this project forward for his glory and pave the way. We will serve missionaries from many organizations with this first vessel. Perhaps other mission organizations will join us in building more vessels. God has helped Tyndale build a team around the Nyes, which includes Tom Hamilton, a pilot, sea captain, and the lead design engineer for the Kodiak. Many Christians have contributed funds. Over $60,000 was given in 2020. The detailed engineering drawings are complete and ready for a boat manufacturer to start construction. God has given us an amazing opportunity to be courageous for Him. We now need $5.5 million secured to build and launch Mission Support Vessel Number 1. Will you join us in this adventure to serve these remote, needy island peoples on the fringes where there are no roads or airstrips? Please, give mightily so we can meet this need with new technology. Will you help us fulfill the Great Commission to these isolated people groups? Please, will you join our crew and stand with us? see so Tom Hamilton and I have reviewed the architectural plans and we sent uh, quotes out and we've actually selected our top three builders uh, two of those builders are here in the Northwest and as we move forward with funding uh, we know that this is a, a large mountain to climb but God is great and your support has gotten us this far and keeps us going uh, this next month, we'll be traveling to the Christian Boaters Association meeting to participate in that. And we have several of our meetings uh, back east uh, and also uh, in combination with those meetings, continuing to raise funds so we can continue to travel and meet with people to discuss uh, the importance of this program. And uh, we also have Tom uh, supporting us with, uh, let's see, um, capital, the large capital programs with grant organizations. And Jeannie has an update on that. How do you eat an elephant? Does anybody know? One bite at a time. This project is way bigger than us. We've never raised this kind of money before. Probably no one else in this room has either. So one of the things that we did to make the project a little more palatable is we broke it down into smaller chunks. So you can go join us in the project in, with a small amount of money to help us get launched. And the way you do that is you go to our website and you can sponsor a life vest. You can sponsor one pound of aluminum to help build the hull of the ship. You can sponsor part of the navigation system. You can, you can sponsor a foot of anchor chain. There are things on the menu there for whatever financial place you're at. So one bite at a time, you can help us get launched again. We, we are, like most missionaries on the planet, we're ready to go. We're ready to serve the Lord. We want to do this. We, we would leave tomorrow if we could. But most missionaries like us are underfunded. So get on board. Help us get out there. We would love to have you on our team. And if you would like to join us in the next, in the next couple of weeks, in the month of September, you can sport one of our t-shirts and market this to the people around you by wearing the t-shirt. How do you reach us? Boday.org. You can find our email address there. We'd love to have you on board. Okay, one of the other things that we're doing, um, we know that it's going to take a lot of bites to eat the elephant. So we are approaching grant organizations. Um, we have just recently submitted for the P uh, PCUSA Women's Organization's birthday grant. Uh, we should hear back in, on that one in a couple of weeks. We are reaching out to the Murdoch Foundation and any other grant organizations that we can find. So if you guys know of any grantors that might be willing to assist us with this project, please let us know. Great. So we, uh, again, thank you so much. 
And I, I would just ask for prayers. Uh, we do have a couple of grant organization meetings pending uh, this fall, now that things are opening up again and we're able to travel freely. Uh, so I'd like uh, to ask your prayer for those uh, meetings to come to fruition. Uh, we've been trying to get them scheduled for the past six months and um, a month goes by and then they say, well, next month. And so we're ready to go. And also just uh, safe prayers for our travels at the end of this month and early October for our meetings back east. And just overall that uh, we just uh, want a prayer of thanks for getting this far and having you uh, participate with us in this race. Thank you so much and God bless. Thank you, Jim and Gina. It's good to have you back with us, and we will certainly pray for you and your mission effort efforts, and, and including right now with our prayers of the people. Before we pray together, uh, I do need to share with you news of, um, I think we've had three deaths in our family of faith in the past um, 10 days, and uh, last Sunday, um, I announced that B. Moss had finished her race. Uh, she died uh, two Saturdays ago at the age of 86. Her memorial service will be October 8th at noon. Her son Robert is here with us today, worshiping with us. It's good to have you with us, Robert. Um, I was not aware of it at the time, but uh, Petrovia uh, Pete, she went by Pete, Petrovia Valentine had finished her race um, the day before, so two Fridays ago. Petrovia was 93. I have reached out to the family and uh, memorial services still to, to be determined. And then on Thursday morning, John Bornson finished his race after um, uh, a year-long battle with pancreatic cancer. Many of us were inspired by the way he, he responded to that terminal illness. Uh, Pastor Margaret and I were able to visit John and Jan, his wife and family, uh, Tuesday. And John's last words uh, to us wa were, I'm ready to go. Uh, and he was, and he has now been received into the joy of God's presence. His memorial service will be Saturday, October 1st at 1 o'clock. So the Bornson Memorial, Saturday, October 1st at 1, and the Moss Memorial, Saturday, October 8th at noon. Let us approach the throne of grace in prayer. Loving God, in Christ you embrace people of every nation and make them members of the same body, sharers in the promise of the gospel. For the Holy Church of God, that through its faithful witness, the wisdom of God in its rich variety, be known in heaven and earth, gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, you judge the people with righteousness and the poor with justice. For nations, rulers, and authorities to forsake violence and be guided by the light of truth that righteousness may flourish and justice abound in every land. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, we never know when we might be entertaining angels unaware. For our country and our state and our city and for all who live here, that we may be a community of hospitality, welcoming the stranger and sheltering the refugee. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, in your providence, creation yields its good fruits that all may enjoy its riches. For our planet Earth, that we may dwell peacefully with nature, be good stewards of its resources, and share its abundance for the sake of human flourishing. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, you defend the cause of the poor, give deliverance to the needy, and save those who are oppressed. For those who suffer the cruelty of poverty, and all who endeavor to transform systems of economic injustice, gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, you take pity on the weak. For those whose bodies are enfeebled by disease or whose spirits are debilitated by illness, 
that they may be restored to wholeness of life. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Loving God, your servant Paul was imprisoned for preaching the good news of Jesus. For any who are wrongly incarcerated, that they may be liberated. And for those whose guilt is valid and imprisonment warranted, that they may know genuine repentance of their sin and reconciliation with their community. Gracious God, Lord of light, hear our prayer. Gracious God, because you have called us your children, we are bold to ask for what we need. And we pray especially for the needs of those in our family of faith. We give thanks for the Nyes and for their mission efforts, and we pray for your blessing upon their fundraising and upon their continued ministry. We pray for Ken Wilbur, for Janet Wiley, for Mike Gaston, for Bill and Mary Lou Mullen, for Pat O'Neill, for Colleen Otten, and for Dick Bird. Bless these people with healing and strength. And we pray for the families of B. Moss, of Petrovia Valentine, and of John Bornson. May they know what it means to be blessed by you in their mourning. Bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them. Be kind and gracious to them and grant them your peace. Confident in your goodness, we pray the prayer your Son has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. There are many ways to present your pledges, tithes, and offerings to our church. You can use the offering box in the narthex. You can send it in by mail. You can present in person at the church office Monday through Thursday from 9 to 4, or you can pledge online uh, using the website listed in, the, in the, your bulletin. The psalmist sings, What shall I return to the Lord for all God's bounty to me? I will give what I have promised in the presence of all God's people. Let us pray. Generous God, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
As you leave this place, may the living Lord go with you. May he go behind you to encourage you, beside you to befriend you, beneath you to lift you up, above you to watch over you, within you to help you walk with faith, hope, and love, and always before you to show you the way. Amen.